Welcome to the Advance Your Art podcast, where we talk about the journey from artist to entrepreneur and everything in between. You've worked hard to hone your craft. Now take it to the next level with tips, techniques, strategies, and routines used by successful artists to grow their businesses and careers. Now, let's get started and have some fun with your host, Yuri Cataldo. Mark, how are you today? Good, Yuri. Thanks for having me. Excellent, excellent. Thank you so much for being on the show. It's it's uh, fantastic. So yeah. I would like to start start off with by asking how it is. How do you describe what it is that you do? Oh, that's interesting. Uh, I wonder what my wife would describe what I do. But all right, so I'm <laughs> a host and producer of WLIE Sports Talk New York, which is mm-hmm. a radio show that airs every Sunday night. And through that, I actually ended up writing two sports books as well. I cover the New York Mets and the New York Rangers, and I'm credentialed with all the four major sports. So that's pretty much what I do. Wow, that's awesome. That's uh. So did you? I'm I'm guessing did did you go to school then to to be in in radio, or how did that evolution happen? Yes, I actually did go to school for communication arts way 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 back when. Uh, did mm-hmm. have a job out of college um, in San Diego for what's pretty much the equivalent of what we would consider News 12 or Fios News 1. And okay. basically at that time, I was very serious with my girlfriend, who would become my fiance and would later on become my wife of over 30 years. And looking at what the salary was going to be, I kind of decided, you know what, I don't think I'm going to be able to raise a family on this, and this is not, mm-hmm. what, you know, at this time, not what I'd want to do. So I went into the business world, uh, worked for many years, had two children, coached my two children in different various sports, uh, travel baseball for my son, basketball for my daughter. And mm-hmm. um, and then when they went off to college, I kind of went back to the communication arts thing. And uh, my wife, who is an educator, had one of her teachers over who was a technology teacher, and showed me this thing called, um, at that time, Ustream. And it, you had the ability to basically broadcast the world just by turning on your MacBook and, you know, just logging on to this program. So I went back to my roots and did, like, a sports talk program on the Internet for a few years. Mm-hmm. Uh, became uh, pretty – had a decent following. Uh, people from Inside Hockey asked me if I wanted to cover the Rangers, so I started writing for them. Uh, someone at ESPN suggested I, I get on some local radio, and that's where I've been now for the last ten years. <laughs> oh wow, that's a that's a great story. So I'm I'm curious then. So with the, the early days on the uh, for your show on the internet, did that? So how did you build up your your audience base that way? Was it because of a, a website that you had, or people you were reaching out to? How did you do that? It's a combination. I, I did start a website. I basically. Really, kind of every morning uh, on my commute to my regular job, uh, mm-hmm. went on like a fishing expedition. You know, searched out people that I was interested in interviewing, sent emails, got emails back. And the the first two or three weeks, we had Gordy Howe on the show. I had you know Phil Esposito, uh, Sugar Ray Leonard, all people that I always oh. wanted to interview. And mm-hmm. from that, we started getting a, a big following. People would watch that. Uh, it was kind of open-ended, so it also had a chat room in it, so lots of sports fans started getting into it. Uh, I was one of the few that really covered the Rangers in the area, and people love hockey, so we did build a very big hockey following. Then through okay. Facebook and Twitter, just got the word out, and, and friends told other friends, and that's basically how it morphed into getting um, a press credential for the Rangers. Um, and through that, you know, people – that would watch the show on the internet would also then hear my voice in post games asking John Tortorello or Wayne Vigneault mm-hmm. questions. And so the following just continued to grow. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's great. So then, so the transition then from what you were doing on your, your own then to being on, uh, you know, the, another version of the radio, how did that transition happen? So did you go a- approach stations and, and, and tell them what no, you I- had? How'd that work? Initially, I was approached by ESPN, who I get ESPN Radio, local radio in New York, okay. who um, evidently they track certain things, and they had, you know, when I went in for a meeting with them, they said, which I had no clue. They said, you know, in the last two seasons, 
you've asked uh, Coach John Tortorella in the post game, you know, 17 questions over the course of the season. Of the 17 questions, 14 times his answer to you was quoted in all three local newspapers. They said, so you're asking the right questions, and we look for people like that. And at that point, I was not ready. I'm, I'm still not ready to do this every day. Mm-hmm. The reason why I, I love what I'm doing and the way I'm doing it is because I can pick and choose who I want to speak to and, and, and follow my passion. And I think that's why it's been successful. I think that's why people mm-hmm. still listen to us. If I had to do it every day, I, I don't think the passion would be there. So it was a very mm-hmm. interesting you know, conversation with them, and they said, you should be on radio. And that's when I started exploring local area, you know, radio stations out here and came across one. Um, and that's where we've been for, like I said, I, I think we, at the radio station, we've been there eight years. We've been doing the show for 10. Okay. Wow, that's great. Congratulations. Thanks. So then with, with the radio itself, then, how did that, that transition into the, um, your book deal or actually your writing career? Most of the eight years of doing it and, and two years on the internet, eight years on terrestrial radio, uh, every week I would come home, every day I'd come home, and there'd be five or six different books waiting for me. And a lot of our guests were authors. And growing mm-hmm. up, which was also a trip for me, I mean, growing up, I, I one of the, the big thrills for me is I actually looked at my sixth grade grade book, you know, autograph book, you know, when you move on from sixth grade into the junior high school, and it's got the front page where it lists your favorites. And uh, mm-hmm. so one of them, you know, it says career, and I wrote a career in sports. Um, favorite author was Phil Pepe, and the book was uh, Of You From the Rim by Phil Pepe. Another one of my favorite <laughs> authors growing up was Peter Golenbach, and I had the opportunity to have them both on our show numerous times. So that was mm-hmm. pretty cool. I mean, from being in sixth grade and then years later interviewing them. So I've always had an appreciation for authors from, you know, my early childhood. Um I, I did take a lot of creative writing when I was taking communication arts uh, years ago, kind of got away from it. Um, and then seeing all these books, a friend of mine in the press box, Howie Carpin, who is the official scorer for both the Mets and the uh, Yankees, and, and he's been on radio for many years as well. He said, why mm-hmm. don't you write a book? I said, Howie, you know, you know me. I'm all about the process. I'm more about speaking to people and, and interviewing and doing the research for interviews. I'm not so much, uh, you know, sitting down at a typewriter and, and doing the discipline that it takes to do a book. He said, well, why don't we do it together? So hmm. I said, all right. I said, he goes, so he goes to me, he goes, you come up with an idea. So I came home one day, and I had come across this book that they sent us, um, and it was called Facing Mariano. And basically what it was was a book about, um, I think it was about 150 baseball players that had hit against Mariano Rivera, and basically it was just their reaction of what it was like to face him, how they did against him. And I told Howie, I said, I can do a book like that, but I need a topic. So it was actually the 10th anniversary of the NHL shootout. I said, why don't we do a history of the shootout and, and really get in depth of how, you know, the penalty shot came about and how it morphed into the, what we now know as an NHL shootout. And from that, I interviewed about 200 people, whether it be players, coaches, general managers, announcers, uh, people that cover the game. And, you know, I pitched it to the, um, the the person that actually, the publisher that did Facing Mariano, they loved mm-hmm. it, and they gave us the book deal, and that was the first one. And I loved the oh. process. I, I loved doing it, and it was really, you know, great doing all those interviews, so I kind of had the bug to do another one, and I didn't know what <laughs> it was going to be on. And okay. my wife and I were in the midst of downsizing and moving, and we were getting our house ready for sale, and we had this wall unit that basically – was built when we first moved in in the late 80s in our house. And uh, we had to redo the floor, so we took down the wall unit. And as we took down the wall unit, I had all these Betamax tapes from the late 80s stored on top of this, you know, break front, and they all came crashing down. And I reached down, <laughs> and the first thing I picked up was opening day 1985, Mets versus Cardinal. And this was a week after Ralph Kiner had passed away, the legendary New York Mets announcer. I run into my garage, and believe it or not, I still had a Betamax deck. I hooked it up to my TV. I put the Betamax tape in. I fast-forwarded. I kept on saying, please be there, please be there, please be there. And then at the end of the game, there's Mookie Wilson and Gary Carter on Kindness Corner. So I said, that's it. I want to do a book on Kindness Corner. So that next morning, I wrote the, the publisher and pitched the idea, and they loved it. And that one has been a lot more successful than our first one, and really was a great project to do. Well, that's great. 
So with that, so with your your books, then are you so are you primarily the one who is marketing and selling the books? Is it, is it through the, the the publisher? Do they have a a team that does that? How do you move books? It's a combination of, of the two. The publishers kind of depend on the authors to get the word out. Um, okay. Because of, of the the kind of well, the NHL book was very good. I mean, I was able to get on in between periods of a Ranger game on ESPN Radio because. The people up in the press box know me, so they, you know, and, and NHL Network and Sirius XM mm-hmm. Radio, so that that was pretty successful that way. The Kiner book had a much broader range uh, of people that really wanted to to talk about it. So it was on television with uh, locally with Steve Overmeyer of CBS, mm-hmm. um, Ed Randall talking baseball, uh, WOR. They actually during the season whenever there was a Met rain delay, we were one of three or four interviews they played during the Met rain delays. So yeah, mm-hmm. and. Um, so Mushnick wrote a little blurb about it in the paper. Neil Best did a two-page article on it in Newsday. So we did get a lot of publicity for that one. Oh, that's great. So I'm curious because you're you you know you're such a busy schedule. How did you find time to write the book? Was there a, you have a certain rituals that you do or routines every single day, or how did that happen? Well, the the hard part was setting up the interviews. So that was the first thing. Okay. I basically made a list. Uh, the hockey one was much easier because the hockey one was written during the time the Rangers were making their run to the Stanley Cup. And since I have press credentials, I'm at every single game. And during the Stanley Cup playoffs, is every single executive is right there. So in between periods, I was able to knock out six or seven interviews every night. Um, the Met one was a little different at the kindest corner because it was also part detective work. So first, I kind of made a schedule for the first month just laying out who I wanted to try and contact, how I'd contact them. Once I had that, after the first month, then the second month I moved into setting up the interviews, doing the interviews. The third month was basically transcribing, and then, you know, how he and I would get together and we'd piece together how we wanted it to come about in, uh, in the book form. So uh, I wouldn't say, you know, I, everything was blocked out, but mentally mm-hmm. I kind of had a, a roadmap of where I wanted to go. Okay. Okay, that that, that sounds like a great, great idea. And then, so are you – are you uh, in the process of writing an, another book, or are you going to stop it, too? Uh, you know what? Originally, I said that was it, and then um, because, you know, I, it occupied a lot of my free time, and I enjoyed it, I actually mm-hmm. I pitched um, a series of four books It's um, to the, the publisher, and he's moved it up the ladder, so we hope to hear this week, and we might be doing four more for them. Hey, that's great. Congratulations. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> So, you know, you've, you've, you've done a, a lot of amazing things and kind of, you know, jumped to a couple of different careers. Besides what you learned in college, were there different additional books that you read or mentors that you reached out to that helped you make the transitions and, and do what you're doing now? I think what it boils down to is over the course of the, you know, the two years on the Internet, every week doing a show and interviewing different people, it, it inspires you. You speak to different people in the sports world, different authors. Um, Ross Bernstein was one. He does a series of books. Uh, one of him, one of the books was Wearing the Sea, which was all about, you know, captains and leadership abilities. Uh, Fran mm-hmm. Tarkenton's book, Every Day is Game Day, is also about, you know, having a vision and, and the different people in his life that inspire him. And, mm-hmm. you know, I was able to tap into a lot of them, you know, because once they were on the show, I remained somewhat friends with them and, and I could call upon them just to, to bounce things off of. So that was much I, I think the show helped build that foundation for me and being able to to speak to people that you know were somewhat mentors but more just in the way they they held themselves and you know went about their business mm-hmm. okay oh, that's great so it's i'm so i'm curious and with with all the people that you've spoken with what would you say has been the best advice or best piece of wisdom that you've ever received wow that's a great question um, it's kind of interesting because it, it was at my son's college orientation, actually. It was something that they were telling the, the incoming freshman class there. And it's kind mm-hmm. of something that stuck with me, uh, ever since that day. And it was basically telling all the students that, you know, they're all there and they all have this vision of what they're going to be and they're pigeonholed and this is their major. And, and you know, they're going to focus on their major and they're going to get a career in that major. And that's what they're, they're there for. But they said that at that point, and my son's out of college for many years already, at that point mm-hmm. they said that the average American worker will change jobs six to eight times in their career. And out of that six to eight times, there's going to be industry.